right. It's all right. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. It is 7 a.m. Our invocation will be led by Tom Moran. Thank you. Um, in honor of uh, Black History Month, I've chosen an inspirational quote this morning by Martin Luther King. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at a time of challenge and controversy. Mr. President. Thank you very much. All right, I'll ask everybody to mute for the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. Um, good to see you all. I do have an announcement. Um, I don't know if anybody got my email last night. Um, John Belmo is in need of assistance for this Saturday speech um, area 11 speech contest. Um, if, if you are available this Saturday, please let him know. He's been trying to get a hold of us to see who's available to do the um, helping out with the speech contest. So I have his email in the, I'll put his email and his um, cell number in the chat and um, let him know if you're um, available to help out this weekend. Um, are there any other announcements? I know Sylvia has an announcement to make. Sylvia? I do. Um, morning. The, now my announcement this morning is a reminder that dues will be coming renewed. And I have a deadline. You'll get an invoice, everyone. And the deadline is to pay by March 16th. Of course, we take a little after, as long as I get it to uh, international but before April 1st. And this is six months, $51, April 1st through September 30th. All or right. One year, either way. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Are there any other announcements from the floor? All right. Well, if anybody has any announcements, we'll save it for till the end. And I would like to um, welcome our Toastmaster today, Samir. Thank you, Eric. Uh, welcome, everyone. This week's theme is winter. Winter is a tough season. It's cold, sometimes it snows, sometimes there are other interesting forms of precipitation like grapple, hail, or freezing rain. Something that our area, I feel like, has to grapple with perennially. Many cultures view winter as a tough time, but also a time for togetherness and enjoying some of the more subtle parts of life that can make things worth living. Yule is a pagan tradition reared in pre-medieval Nordic times and it often occurs at the solstice. It involves lighting a Yule log uh, that's lit from the remains of the prior year's Yule log over the 12 days of Christmas and celebrating the light during the coldest and darkest time of the year. Luckily for us, we're past that, but we're st still pretty much in the thick of it <clears throat> with many traditional activities like sledding, skiing, and enjoying hot chocolate being enjoyed among many of us. As to myself, I feel like in my fifth year returning to the region, I finally maybe started to acclim acclimatize myself to the cold and get used to it. Although I'm still not sure I'll ever be the kind to wear shorts outside as I seem to see whenever I go down a crowded street, <clears throat> even for a brief jaunt. One tradition that's pretty nice and I think all of us could benefit from is the Danish tradition called Hygge, spelled H-Y-G-G-E. It's not a specific celebration, it's more of a feeling that doesn't exactly have a translation into English, but it's 
a sense of coziness, comfort, and complete relaxation that you could enjoy while enjoying a good conversation around a winter fireplace with friends. You can feel Huga at any time of year, but winter itself especially lends itself to the feeling. A, a recent book on Huga helped kept, ha, bring the term to the attention of most of us Americans, in addition to a plethora of articles that appeared afterwards. Throughout the meeting, I'll be mentioning different festivals and things from cultures around the world that are used in winter to bring that same sense of hygge to various people. With that, I would like to introduce the roles. Uh, the next person role I'd like to introduce is the word master. So Larry, if you'd like to continue with the word of the day. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Today, our word of the day will be, as you can all see, it is blizzard. Now, I know we're all familiar with that in the Western New York area. Uh, blizzard is the word of the day. And a blizzard, in case you're not familiar with it, the National Weather Service defines a blizzard as a storm with large amounts of snow or blowing snow, winds greater than 35 miles per hour and visibility of less than one quarter mile for at least three hours. Some blizzards called ground blizzards have no falling snow. Mr. Toastmaster, I will be reporting back later on the word of the day, blizzard, and I will put the definition in the chat. Back to Thank you. you Larry. Uh, Nancy Ferry is our awe master, if you'd like to introduce your role. You're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> I will be listening for errs, ahs, ums, filler words. And you can use the word blizzard, but don't use the word blah, blah, blah. Thank you, and I will report back when called upon. Thank you. Great. Uh, I see Ryan Flores listed as our grammarian, but I don't see... Ryan, are you in the meeting? I don't see him. Can someone else take the grammarian role? Uh, <clears throat> Tom Moran? Go ahead. Uh, you're on mute if you'd like to. Yeah, I see role. that. Uh, Beth, Beth put her hand up too. I'm sure she would be better at it, but I'll take a shot at it today. And Beth, you can um, you can send me a chat if I miss anything. Okay. But I'm going to be the grammarian this morning. That means I'll be listening to the speakers, table topics, people. And when I see or hear something that uh, strikes me as is not what good use of grammar. I'll make a note of it when I see something or hear something that <clears throat> would be considered um, poor grammar. I'll also note that and get that back to the Toastmaster when called upon. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Tom. The <clears throat> quote master selects um, a quote for the meeting to help guide our guide us and provide some insight. Uh, Carol Ann, if you would like to introduce your quote. Yes, the quote I have is from Chief Crowfoot, a Native American from the Blackfoot Confederacy. The white man's police have protected us only as well as the feathers of a bird protected from frost of winter. And a second quote from him, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in the winter time. It is the little shadow that runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Carol, that was great. Now our jester, uh, Jackie Kenny, if you'd like to provide us with some humor. 
Good morning. Living through the blizzard of 77 was no joke. I have a few little riddles for you. What did Frost, why did Frosty the snowman want a divorce? Anybody? Because he thought his wife was a flake. What do you call a snowman with a six pack? An abdominal snowman. What do snowman, snowmen eat for breakfast? Come on, guys. Snowflake. I see Tom Moran saying it. Frosted flakes. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what vegetable was forbidden on the ships of Arctic explorers? Nobody? Leeks. 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 Thank you. <laughs> what did the snowman and his wife put over their baby's crib? A blank of the snow. A snowmobile. <laughs> Enough of that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> that was great, Jackie. Thanks. Leeks are a great soup vegetable as well. Mike Licata is our timer. If you'd like to introduce your role, Mike. Good morning, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and I guess this morning I'll try to do my best um, to with the timing. Table topics is one and a half to two minutes. Speeches are usually five to seven, and our evaluators are two to three minutes. And just if you, anybody is speaking, uh, just find me on their screen. I'll raise my hand and. We'll make sure you'll know your exact time and whether or not you're in time. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is Sylvia on? I am. I'm on. Great. If you'd like to introduce your role as our gesture master and tech. Well, today I will be looking for the people's um, technology backgrounds and mostly because it's pretty hard to do the other end of it or getting everybody to um, talk louder or verbal and um, just their normal gesture in the speaking that they're going to go into the camera out of the camera hand movements face gestures uh, touching their glasses how many times uh, my eye doctor told me to, yesterday that 11 times out of an hour, every hour, people touch their face. That was kind of interesting. So that's kind of what I'll be doing this morning or will be doing, not kind of, will be doing. Great, thank you. And David Jones, our quiz master, if you'd like to introduce your role. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Greeting fellow Toastmasters and guests. Unfortunately, Dairy Queen was closed this morning, so I have coffee instead of a Butterfinger blizzard. And this morning, I'll be listening to everybody's speeches or talks and taking notes so that I can quiz you all later on. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Great. Thank you. Now, as we have a minute, I'd like to talk about a festival in Iceland called Borobot. It's a midwinter festival that takes place in the mid-January to mid-February timeframe. And it's based around a sacrificial ritual meant to keep things favorable with the old man winter. So they deliberately hit it once Christianity took over on the island. But now that it's been revived, they basically have a massive feast of foods that are dried or salted or preserved. Things like pickled whale blubber, sheep's head, or fermented Greenland shark that quote unquote puts hair on your chest. Now with that, I would like to go to Marty Johnston for our table topics. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, good morning. I have three contestants this morning. Tying along with the theme of winter, I would like to ask Beth Banks, remembering the blizzard of 77, 
what good came out of the blizzard of 77 for you and your family? Beth, thanks. And remember to use the word of the day, blizzard. Thank you, Marty. The blizzard of 77. Well, it was difficult, um, but I would say one of the things that came out of it that was good for my family was my husband's look at uh, different people. He was working in Niagara Falls at the time and he volunteered to take one of the ladies home who was not able to get her car out. So he and I don't even remember her name, but they went uh, on their way, tried to be on their way. They ended up getting stuck in the city of Niagara Falls and they, the first house they could go to, it was a black family and they took them in. Actually, I think it was the second house. I think the first house, the people refused to take them in. It was very interesting for him because as we've talked in Toastmasters before, the uh, show Roots was going on during the blizzard of 77. So here he and this woman, uh, are with this family, black family, and watching Roots. So it was it was quite an experience, but it did, it was good for him to see that. The gentleman did drink a little and then was becoming very vocal against whites. So it was a little uncomfortable, but it was also a good learning experience for him to see how the, uh, blacks were taking that movie differently than what we were taking it. Met, uh, Mr. Toastmaster, Mr. Tabletop. Table Topics Master, thank you thank very you much. And uh, hopefully we won't have a blizzard this year. <clears throat> Thomas, Thomas, during your military career, Thomas, Thomas H., did you experience any blizzards or storms that you remember during your training? And could you could you paint a picture of that for us, Thomas, using the word of the day blizzard? Thomas. Good morning, my fellow Toastmasters. Uh, my two minutes uh, table topics on in the military winners. There's two. One was in Texas where every car only has like $50 tires on them. They're not all weather, they're not winterized. They're basically, they just slide everywhere. So having a vehicle from up north with me down south, I was actually able to transport people back and forth when there was a driving ban. And it's not like they don't salt or need salt down there. It's the fact that they, it's their tires. The one that I like the most is my pictures from Saudi Arabia. I have them behind me. It would take me too long to find the picture. But there's multiple pictures of us in the, sit, standing around the desert, and we're all bundled up. We've all got our hats and scarves, everything pulled around, so we can only see a little bit of our faces. We've got the thick mittens on. Everyone's like, it's the desert. And you have to explain. No, it's just as hot as it gets in the day. All the, all the, all the uh, heat leaves at night. So in the wintertime, you wake up and there is actually literally frost on everything. And it's freezing cold when you first wake up, especially the army loves to get up before the sun gets up. And then within like two hours of the sun being up, all of a sudden it's like 65, 70. So you're starting to strip. And before you know it, it's 90 degrees. So the, far, the temperature extremes in a desert are one of the things that I thought was the most amazing about winter in the desert. And this table topics. Thank you, Thomas. Next, Margo, during the blizzard of 77, what did you keep busy doing? I know your family owns an orchard. Were you planning? Were you planning nope. for the next season? No. Nope. Reading, were you cooking? Were you shoveling snow? Please share your experience, Margo, thank you. What blizzard of 77? In 1977, I was in Ithaca, New York at Cornell, and we got maybe a half an inch. 
the most snow I saw actually was on the hockey rink at Cornell when the skaters were doing their thing and the Zamboni had to come around because Jim would, we had met in the dorm that year and he was taking me to various hockey games because he was the manager of the hockey team. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about when you talk about the blizzard of 77. But if you ask me about the blizzard of 69 in Albany, that I can tell you about. We had snow, I was 10 years old, snow came up over my shoulder. We lost electricity. It was an absolutely fascinating experience back then. Of course, we had school, no school for like four days, which I thought was great because I was one of those people who had to walk to school uphill on ice both ways. I know, actually uphill one way, downhill the other. So we didn't have to do anything except sit home, put some candles on and, as I do now, I read, and unfortunately, I had only taken six books out of the library that week, and I went through them all, so I had to reread them. But I have no idea what people are talking about when they say the blizzard of 77. I was walking uphill in a mini skirt and really fancy boots, Mr. Table Topics Master. Thank you, Margo. Thank you all our of our contestants this morning for table topics. At this point, I'd like to call for a Wordmaster report from Marty. Yeah. How are you? I am ready. Wordmaster report. From the beginning of the meeting, I will give the entire report up till this time. Our Toastmaster has used the word of the day, Samir. We also had Nancy using the word of the day, Jackie Kenny, David Jones also with butter. Oh, yes. Butterfinger blizzard. That was the most unique way of using it. Now, Marty, you use the word four times. But when we get to our table topics, contestants, Beth used the word of the day three times. Thomas neglected to use the word of the day throughout his uh, table topic speech. But Margo tied you, Marty, with four times using the word of the day. So we have Beth and Margo both qualify. Back to you, Mr. Table Topics Master. Thank you, Larry. Now I would like to call for a word master report and then turn control of the meeting back over to the Toastmaster Samir. Our word master is word master or oh, our timer, Mike Lakata. How do we fare on time, Mike? Good morning, Mr. Toastmaster. I'm proud to tell everyone that all three of our speakers qualified. For on time this morning, Beth at 150, Thomas at 141, and Margo at 131. So on time, all of our speakers qualified. Thank you. I'd like to con turn control of the meeting back over to our Toastmaster of the day, Samir. Thank you, Marty. What Thank a you. Um, apt topic for our table topics. Um, now I'd like to introduce our evaluators uh, to introduce Come our on, you're killing me. To introduce our speakers. Philip Russell is our first evaluator. And um, Philip, if you could introduce uh, the first speaker. I had to unmute myself. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Now, I am going to be evaluating Moklas, but I have no information. I don't even have the time. And so, but I did download and print one of our standard forms for evaluation on pathways, regardless of whether the speech is from pathways or not. I need to know the time. I need to know the uh, length of the speech. I don't have that. I'm going to turn it back over to the Toastmaster. And hopefully, Shamir, you have that information and you can bring me up to speed. But I will evaluate Moklis with our standard evaluation forms from the new pathways. So over to you, Shamir. Uh, I know that the speech title is uh, an ode to Dosto Nassimo Hawk. I imagine the speech time will be 
the normal five to seven minutes, but uh, no close if you can go ahead. Uh, can, can you speak to the length of your speech? It's five to seven minutes. Okay. Uh, all right. The speech, I believe, is titled Ode to Dustin and Seymour Hawk. And you can begin. Good morning, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and our guests. Unfortunately, I had a sad event January 6th of this year. My long-term friend, almost 52 years, passed away January 6th. I met Nasimul at my PF public school Sargoda in 68 as he joined the school soccer team. He was an excellent center forward and I had the left wing position. We played many practice sessions with our mathematics teacher, coach, Mr. Nasir Ahmad Chaudhary. He was elevated to become the soccer team captain while I became the swimming team captain. And this is a picture of, I would say 1968 or 69. Nasimul is on the left and I am on the right and the other members of the team. As uh, usual, he was a prominent man in Bangladesh. So there was an article on the day he passed away title former Biman, which is the airline for Bangladesh, Captain Nasimul Haq passed away. He had a very luminous career and a wonderful, wonderful life of excellent profession as well as personally very humorous, caring and generous person. Both Samir and I had the pleasure to meet him in Bangladesh. I think this was Samir's visit in 2005 or 2006. I believe it was one of the tea garden where they met. And fortunately for Samir and not for me, he visited him again in 2018 and spent some time with him while he was going around the world. He had a very packed itinerary, but he also got time and Nassim is also very busy usually. They managed to get together again. In the process, 32 years later, Nassim will found me in internet. We parted from high school in the year 69, 70. And then year 2000, he discovered me and I was delighted. We really had a excellent relationship since 2000. I visited him in 2001 in Bangladesh while I was working in Singapore. I don't like to go to Bangladesh that much. So my trip was really a three day weekend to spend with him. It was a fun filled weekend. Two years later, he and I planned a trip to our ancestral home where my parents and grandfather established a high school. It's called Long Pekola High School. So this was the trip, November 21st, 2005. This was our inside picture with Nasimul. And this was our landing site at the ground of the high school. There are quite a few people who gathered there. 
And this is the picture of the people who came to, I guess, greet us, honor us, and make our visit very memorable. You see the little white hel helicopter crowded by people. Some were afraid that the helicopter might uh, crash or do something because of the crowd we had. At the end of the time, I wrote a little ode for my friend on the next day and shared it with his family and his many, many, many admirers. Nasimul came to this world flying, giving joy to the world, living this world smiling while saddening all of us, joyfully celebrating a life of wonderful memories. Our heart is in deep sorrow, our mind is grateful of a life full of energy, accomplishments, and kindness. He flew the skies in strides with many humors. May he find joy and eternal happiness hereafter. This is the picture that I like the most. I think he had so many thousands of journeys in his life. And this is the final journey. And I consoled his family and my friends, including myself. We need to celebrate his life, not feel too much sorrow because he had a wonderful, wonderful life of giving and sharing. Again, this is a picture with Samir when he was visiting second time. And two quotes that he really represents, the wisdom and everything in his life. Don't believe everything you hear. There are always three sides to the story. Yours, theirs, and the truth. Other one also he practiced and enjoyed is don't raise your voice. Improve your argument. He was a great man and I celebrate his wonderful life of sharing with me, my family, and all the friends and families of his. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Moklas. He was a good man. Uh, our next evaluator is Eric Schneider, who will be introducing our second speaker, Stephen Smith. Eric, you're on mute right now. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Um, I don't have um, any information from Steve, um, so he's gonna, I'm, I'm gonna evaluate freely, um, but his time is five to seven minutes, right, Steve? Yes. All right, and Mr. Toastmaster, do you have his title? I do, it's called how I got into theater, and it will be five to seven minutes. Stephen Smith. Thank you. Recently, Dave Licata posted a picture on Facebook, and it was of Dave, Phil Russell, and me in costume for the play, The Importance of Dur du Being Earnest. That was the first play I ever appeared in. And I got to remembering about that. That's where it all started. And the story of how I got into it was more involved than I thought at the time. Because from my point of view, uh, they were short a player for the first act, a butler. So those two gave the director my name. They called me and I said, sure, I'll do it. And I thought that was it. And I had a great time doing it. But I didn't find out until opening night, the whole story. Opening night, Friday, an hour before we're going on, the director had his little ritual he wanted to go through, and they all do. They all do something a little different. We were in the, the dressing room was in the basement below stage, so he had us all get around the circle and had us tell something memorable about the whole experience. 
And I just, I had talked about how the whole thing was, was new to me and I enjoyed it. The director gets up there and he says, well, what happened? Dave and, and Phil gave me your number and I called your number and I had to leave a message. And I have to back up a second here because on my phone, I have a different type of message. And that's because of the mood I was in when I finally figured out how to put a message in my phone for the voicemail. And it said, this is Steve Smith. I don't want to talk to you right now. So leave a message and I'll get back to you. Now, the director was relaying all this. And I said, oh, yeah, that's what I put on there. And he said, I heard that message and I said, I want him. Now, here they're just dumping all this on me an hour before we go on stage. Said, oh, this is funny. All right. But that's where it started. That was my first play, and the bug bit hard. And I was in a number of plays after that. I was in, uh, I have a whole list of them. I was in a mousetrap. I was in Arsenic and Old Lace. Now, that was a fun story, too. I started out in the first act, I had a part as a kindly minister. And anybody that knows me knows that's not exactly typecasting. And the one night we were just, we were still in the early stages reading. And the guy that was playing Lieutenant Rooney in the third act didn't show up. So the director says, will you read this part just to help the other people stay with their timing and everything? Goes, sure. Okay. Well, I grabbed a book. Now my first line is Rooney. I get to walk on stage and I look at the other cops. What the hell are you doing here? I told you I was going to handle this. And then I just launched into it. And after we read that night, the director said, do you want that part? That was my first attempt at playing a loud mouth clown on stage. And it was a lot of fun doing that. In fact, some of the other actors told me that they thought I was serious when I was yelling at them. But no, that's the character. I went on to do another loud mouth when I played uh, Dr. Chumley and Harvey. And that's a funny story too, because I got, I was on stage doing my part with a, another actor who was playing another doctor. And I had to turn to him and say, do you know what you've done? Now, when I did that, it shook the guy and he threw all these papers up off the desk. And I said, oh, that's good. I like that. That's good ad living. It works. When we got off stage, he said, you stop it. I went, what? you scared me and I threw those papers up. I, so it looked good. He said, yeah, but all my crib notes were on there for my lines. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> now that was the second time I played a loud mouth buffoon. Do you see a pattern here? That was probably the most fun I ever had on stage was, was doing those two roles. And I went on to do a number of other roles. It was in 10 Little Indians as a butler again. There's another pattern emerging. This eventually led to doing what we call the dinner theater, mystery murder dinner theaters down to Mar Margin Manor with Margo. They asked me to work on there. And now that's a total night and day difference because when you're on stage, everything is very tightly rehearsed. So the next actor knows what their line is. And we know what the next action is and it's got to have a flow to it. The murder mysteries are the exact opposite. These, they're almost totally improv, or at least to start with, we know where we're going with all this, but it's just totally improv as we're putting it together. They're both great experiences. In fact, that's a whole nother speech talking about doing the murder mysteries. And I had a, I have had a great time doing that. Well, at the moment, we're in the middle of this COVID business and live theater has been totally cut off for over a year now. And I do miss that, but it will come back and I'll get back into it. But I wanted to say from all of this, I want to thank Dave and Phil for getting me started in all this in the first place. It's led to the long, wonderful road that I've been down performing on stage. And actually, I just saw it as another chapter of what I do because to me, doing my star shows is putting on a performance to get people interested in what I'm showing off in the heavens. So this just seemed an extension of that. And I want to thank Dave and Phil again for that. But I also wanted to remind them, you do know you created a monster. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Stephen. That was great. Our next evaluator is Jill Roaring, who will be introducing Dave Licata. Jill? Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. 
you know, Steve turn yourself. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. I will be evaluating Dave this morning. His speech is five to seven minutes. It is his title is Bromides. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Joe. Now we have Dave Licata with Bromides. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and as I say often, where are the guests? Well, in case there's a few people out there that don't know what bromides are, they are frequently used phrasings like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It's always darkest before the dawn. Tough winter, beautiful summer, things like that, bromides. Matter of fact, I shared a bromide with my son this morning that my mother used to use on me, but this is a mixed audience and I can't use it. But reminding everybody that Michael is my mother's revenge, so that'll fill in. Well, a long time ago and far away, I was an account executive for WJJL Radio in Niagara Falls. And I'm gonna share with you my favorite bromide and how it relates to this little tale that I'm about to tell. While I was at WJJL, the Summit Park Mall opened and we were invited, us account executives, the guys that sold the advertising, wrote the commercials, made sure they got aired. And that's why we use the word executive because we made sure the account got executed and that everything was done properly. So we split up the accounts. I got a little shoe store called Gallon Camp Shoes. The manager explained to me, well, we don't advertise too much, but when we open up, uh, we run a little, little flight on radio and I'll have my advertising agency contact. And I said, that's great. Well, a couple of days later, I got a letter from the Carnahan Advertising Agency of Columbus, Ohio. And I opened it up and it was a flight for about $250 and stretched over about 10 days, which is pretty good. It's nice. It was a nice little, nice little shot because I was on salary plus commission. Well, my salary wasn't that great, but my commission was 20%. And that's how that works out at WJJL. Well, the, ma the mall, even though it had opened, it had not reached its full complement of stores yet. So we would watch as things would open up. We were wondering what was going on. Well, they were making progress. New stores were opening. And I got another big envelope on my desk from the Carnahan Advertising Agency of Columbus, Ohio. And I said, oh, wonderful. Galen Camp's going to spend another 250 Well, it's better than nothing. Well, I opened up the envelope, and much to my delight, York Steakhouse and Gallon Camp Shoes had the same advertising agency and they had my name, which meant I could write the business. And much to my extreme delight, York Steakhouse believed in radio and they believed in it to the extent that they were gonna spend $1,800 in about two weeks for their grand opening. I said, this is marvelous. What a piece of luck, you know? So they had their grand opening. I said, that's great. And then much to my surprise and even more delight, another envelope came. It's from Carnahan Advertising of Columbus, Ohio. And it's for York Steakhouse. Well, they're gonna, not gonna spend 1,800 this time, they're gonna spend 1,500. So I said, well, yeah, that'll get them going in their first month of business. Well, to make a long story short, that check came about every month. They advertised every month and they advertised to the tune of about $1,000. Now, remember that that was my budget. Anything I sold over $1,000, I started making commission on. So this was, this was fantastic. So I'm just rolling along. Lucky me, I got this account. Well, one day at WJJL, the phone rang and it was a very important call because it was from a big advertising agency in New York City, Olga V. Mather. And guess what? 
the owner wasn't in. Normally the owner would take that call and he would keep the commission. The sales manager, he was busy over at the Red Coach entertaining clients. The other salesman, and we only had two, junior and senior, and I was junior. He wasn't entertaining clients, but he was being entertained by his uh, girlfriend in her one station, one room beauty shop. And I was the only one in the station. And the phone rang and that gentleman gets a hold of me and says, hey, Dave. And I think it said his name was Don Draper. He said, can you help me out? I said, sure, what can I do for you, sir? He said, well, I, my agency handles Ponderosa. I said, really? Yeah. He says, the guy that manages the Ponderosa in Niagara Falls is driving me crazy. He's calling up here every day because every time he turns on his radio, all he hears is your steakhouse. Can you help me out and get another thousand dollars advertising in there for Ponderosa? I said, yes, sir. Now I've got both these steakhouses. They're both using radio. So my favorite bromide would be, I'd rather be lucky than good. Thank you very much, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, David. That was great. Can we get a time a timers report? Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. All of our speakers qualified this morning. Moklis at 6.50, Steve at 5.44, and Dave at 5.52. So all of our speakers did qualify this morning. Thank you. Great. And can we also get a word master's report? You don't need one. While you're, or after, after we vote. Actually, I'll, I'll give the word raster report at the end of the meeting. Okay, great. All right, keeping with our theme of winter in Manitoba, they have a beard growing contest as part of Winnipeg's Festival du Voyageur, a 10 day celebration like they right. celebrate their French heritage and fur trading past. It starts February 12th, so right around this time of year. And the beard growing competition has a variety of length, styles, and shapes in four distinct categories, including novelty beards, clean shaven, where they have eight weeks to start and open, meaning that they can create their own beards using whatever accoutrements they desire. Also at the same time, Chinese New Year starts this year on the 12th. This year will be the year of the ox and the period from, the, from today, the fourth, until the 11th, is called the Litter, Little Year, and it's a time of memorial and prayer services, which includes house cleaning to sweep away bad luck, as well as praying to the stove god to keep them warm. With that, I would like to introduce our first evaluator, Philip Russell. Okay. I want to say this, an ode to a, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, a dosto, dosto, which is a friend, tough thing to do. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, Moklis, whenever you're giving a eulogy or that, it is so difficult because that's one of your best friends. You traveled worldwide just to see him. It was amazing that you did it. And he passed away just not too long ago. So you did a great job with that. Now, I, I went over the evaluation form, and it's a generic one. But I wanted to let you know. Now, in Zoom, one of the things that you are, you're closer to the lens. And that's that's okay, because I can see your face perfectly I, I in that hat. That's the first thing I noticed. Only certain people could get away with wearing something like that. I couldn't get away with that. I usually wear baseball caps, but it did. It, it makes it look authentic. You look great. That whole, the way you use the technology, it was great. Because let me tell you something. I got to know this man. 
I got to know how close you were to him. And that's important in giving a eulogy or an ode to somebody. It was amazing because I felt I could really feel your feelings in there. Now, they talk about vocal variety. Now, in something like this, I don't know if you need to have a lot of vocal variety simply because it's a, it's a very heartfelt thing they're doing. It's important to get your emotions in there. And anytime I've heard a eulogy, very rarely do I hear a lot of vocal variety. Some people can, uh, and if it's a close friend, sometimes you use a lot of humor and, and things like that, but you didn't need it. I got to know this man. I got to know how close you were to this man from a very young age, right up until the time he died, you stayed close to him. That's an amazing thing. That is a, a, unbelievable. When you can stay close to somebody for so long, it's great. And I felt that. I got to know your friend. You did a great job with this. Now, I know this is a whitewash, but I, the only thing I put in here for this is just check on how far you should be from the camera. You know, that's about it. <laughs> you don't need to stand because it's a eulogy, it's an ode. It's, it was amazing how I got to really know this gentleman and how kind he was and how close you two were together. I thought it was a phenomenal job. I wrote it all out and most everything was a five. I did have a couple of things on the vocal variety, but it's not necessary. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you for, for that great evaluation. Our next evaluator is Eric Schneider. Eric, if you'd like to go ahead and evaluate Steve. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and especially Steve. Steve, I enjoyed your speech this morning. You are such a wonderful actor. Here's my question. Would, could you be nominated for a Tony? I, because I would like to see you winning a Tony because you you have an impressive resume of acting and being in plays. I think you should be nominated for a Tony. This morning, you gave us a speech that you're so well known because of your acting. And basically it was like a little bit of a biography of how you got into acting. And what I enjoyed was how you, you're, that, that person was listening to your voicemail and they picked you, they wanted you to be acting in, a, in, a, uh, in the play. And I'm like, hey, I, maybe I should do that. Maybe I should want to act. Maybe I want to change my voicemail because normally I like to say in a calm and nice tone, maybe I'll try your method as to doing the, um, a vo do a, do a acting in the voicemail, that's awesome. And I like how you acted in plays and the murder mystery, which I also do miss because with this pandemic, I really like to do more of the murder mystery. Maybe I might do that in another poetry reading or something, maybe dress up something like that. Basically, you brought us in with your acting, engaging us. You also had some good gestures, eye contact. Everything was on point today. What you may want to work on, Steve, is a slowing down just a tiny bit. You went a little fast, and then you went a little slow. But keep working on that. But, oh, no, you were doing pretty good there. Now, for future speeches, maybe try standing up a bit. Maybe like act out your, maybe more acting out by standing up and more engaging. And maybe try on a costume of your favorite play. Maybe to get us more what, um, how you got into theater and what your favorite play was. But other than that, wonderful speech. I enjoyed it and I look forward to your next speech. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Eric, for that great evaluation. Our next evaluator is Jill Roaring, who will be evaluating Dave Licata's speech for us. 
Good morning, Mr. Toastmaster, all our toast, all of my fellow toasters, and especially Dave Licata. Dave, this was the second time you did this speech. I don't know, I did not pay attention that closely the first time because I was not evaluating it. But the things I paid attention to this time, you did an excellent job. And you're always hard to evaluate because everything you do is right. Your vocal variety is fantastic. You're up and down, you're leaning, you're going forward to the, to the camera. Your hand gestures were awesome. Although at times they went off the screen. It's a little bit hard to, I think most of the time I could tell what your hands were doing off the screen just because of what was going on. But pay attention to that when you're doing a speech. Your eyes at times, even though you were focused on the camera, it was like you were looking sideways. I'm not sure if that's something you always do. I made it up to full speaker mode so I could see better, which I don't normally do. And that might be why I noticed it. Your ending, of course, was good, just as it was the time before. I'd rather be lucky than great. That was definitely the theme here. You explained your entire, the mechanics of being a account executive and the actual reason that it's an executive. It's not an executive in the true sense of an executive. It's an executive because you make sure everything gets executed. All in all, it was an excellent speech, same as your speeches always are. I think it was an improvement on the first time. I'd like to think your gestures and stuff were better but I'm not sure because I didn't evaluate it the first time like the recommendation is for this speech. So thank you, Dave Licata, for this wonderful speech. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Jill. That was a great evaluation. Now could we get a timers report? Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters. All of our evaluators did make time this morning. Phil at 3.13, Eric at 2.30, and Jill at 2.34. So all of our evaluators did qualify this morning. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Now, if everyone will vote. Okay, and Last but not least, our general evaluator is Jennifer Zapla. Jennifer, if you'd like to give your evaluation of our overall meeting. Absolutely, thank you, Samir. Overall today, how did we do? I noticed something missing on Zoom and Dave, I have to say, it's you. You're missing because back at Tom's Diner, we used to clap. Well, Dave used to lead our clapping and I noticed today that our clapping is becoming a little lackluster. We're like, meh, a few of us here and there in between. So I think Dave, you need to pick up the Zoom clap. Yes, wave, get excited. I, that always added to the energy in the room. And I missed that a little bit today. I noticed it's been on the decline lately. So I wanted to point that out first. Samir, as our Toastmaster today, Excellent job with getting us to start on time. I know you really uh, put it to Eric that it was seven o'clock and I appreciate that because occasionally we get off on a tangent and we start a few minutes late. There were a few times when I noticed you reading notes which could become a little bit distracting. And I appreciate the virtual background, but you do disappear in it occasionally. So you may wanna consider that in your setting. You're just like a little off center and sometimes it's a little distracting. But overall, your theme today was interesting, something that we can all relate to right now in the middle of winter and February in Buffalo. 
And you brought us a lot of interesting information to keep the, the meeting going. I think you did an excellent job leading and into transitions in and out of transitions. You were very smooth. You filled in roles when they needed to be filled in. And I saw that there were some communications throughout the week to make sure that we had those filled and especially some last minute openings that we did end up filling. So that was exciting. It's always great when we have a full slate to work with. Now for our evaluators today, evaluators, times and titles, two of those were in the agenda. So I wanna point out that when you're a speaker and an evaluator, you're here to provide a unified front. You're a team, you're coming in, it's like your boss and you, and you're coming in and you're giving this unified front. And I think that when we, even when we don't have the information, it's up to us to present in a unified manner and make it not so negative when we don't have those items ahead of time. And it's partially up to us as evaluators to make sure that we get that information when we don't have it. So to send a text message or to check the agenda, it's up to both the speaker and the evaluator. Just like if you went into a meeting at work and you were going in with other people, it's up to you to be prepared for that, whatever happens. And sometimes things come last minute. I do understand that. I did feel our, our evaluators today were a little light on the meat in the sandwich. <laughs> I see some nods, so I know I'm not the only one who thought so. Now, I didn't pay a ton of attention to our speakers today because I wasn't here really to evaluate them, but I would just recommend that our evaluators make sure that they're spending that time and really giving the critical feedback that's needed because that's actually, or constructive feedback, I should say, because that's what we're here for is to improve and to get better. And it's really helpful to have a person point that out to you. I know now we have the added benefit of Zoom where we can go back and watch our speeches because sometimes we are not coming off at all like we think we are. So it, that's helpful, but without the other person directing us in those ways, it's not always obvious to us either. So Mocha's one thing I actually thought when you were giving your speech, and I did want to let you know, was when you were sharing, particularly at the end, I, I appreciated all the pictures, but at the very end when you were um, reading the ode, I actually wanted to see more of your face, and I wasn't sure you actually needed to be sharing your screen at that moment, because I think, as Phil mentioned, there was a lot of emotion behind it, and I think it would have been more effective to just see your face from the Zoom format. So that was one thing I wanted to point out to you. Otherwise, that is my evaluation of the meeting. And Mr. Toastmaster, would you like to call for our the rest of our reports? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. Now, our first report will be the word master, Larry McKenzie. If you would like, Mr. Toastmaster, we can give the report people an opportunity to use the word because okay that will probably help <laughs> <laughs> fair enough all right nancy farrier our master if you'd like to give your report i would thank you mr toastmaster i didn't hear a blizzard of ums and ahs but i think we can call it maybe flurries the the hard part about being the um, ah, master, is that I feel like I'm majoring in the minors and sometimes I miss the big picture of what people are saying. Now, I'm not sure if that is a bromide, David, or not majoring in the minors, but I will use that today. The other filler word that I heard several times was now. I'm not sure if that's a filler word, but it seemed to be used in that context, particularly with Steve and Phil. It's like now, now, maybe we're using those instead of buts and, and I have a dog that is concerned about the workmen outside. So I will wrap it up and say, good job. There were some ands and ums and ahs. But basically, I think we are learning and growing in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. 
Now, our grammarian, Tom Moran. Thank you, Mr. Postmaster. I kind of nodded out for a minute there. I was thinking about that barking dog and what a dilemma that might have been for the poor dog, I guess. Our grammar is good in most, in most cases. And I appreciate the words that stick out a lot for, for me anyway. Mr. Toastmaster, you used the word fermented this morning and it always reminds me of there's a Scandinavian show about cooking and they always seem to whatever food they're making seems to have been fermented at some time. <clears throat> It's not very appetizing. I don't know why I watch it. Just to, I guess to see what what they might be cooking on that particular day. But I do like the word. I, I like that word fermented. Some of the things that we have to be careful of in our speaking is, and it was very apparent this morning that people don't enunciate the full word. They use going, working. It's it's very casual or, or maybe even conversational, but in a speech, it's very noticeable to me anyway. And I do use it myself. I get caught in that trap every once in a while. So we have to be aware of that. Now, I'm surprised that uh, Margot didn't jump out of her seat when I gave my initial assessment of what a grammarian does, because I used I could see poor grammar. Now, I was speaking metaphorically, Margo. I, 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 I visualize, I, I'm a visual person, so I visualize a, a lot, but I, granted, I know you can't see good grammar. <clears throat> I did notice, like with, with David, I, I like the word bromide, David, if he's still here, I really, I really can't see him on the screen. But I did like the word, but I was confused as to, it, it kept, I kept wrestling with it during your speech as to what the importance of the word bromide and that particular use of the, of the word in your speech, well, how it was relevant to what you were talking about. You did, uh, David also used the, much to my surprise, he used that three times. And I thought maybe instead of using a much to my surprise, he could have, he could have acted out more. Uh, I'm used to, I mean, he's very accomplished at uh, hand gestures and, and acting out a, a part. So he could have, he could have used that as uh, his acting chops there and, and gotten more, more out of it. I'm looking right at you right now, David. So, um, Let's see, uh, Phil, who was it that said, oh, it was Steve, said Dave, Phil, and me. Now, I think this should be Dave, Phil, and myself. And uh, that caught me, uh, caught my ear, <clears throat> not my eye. And I tried to, I, I'm, my hearing is going uh, because of different treatments that I've had, and I, I am somewhat impaired that way, so I didn't catch a lot and I had another distraction. I had a, a message on my, my phone, uh, an urgent message that my uh, car warranty is about to expire. So I tried to get that taken care of as well. So that's my report, Mr. Toastmaster, and thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Tom Ram, with a great grammatical evaluation of our meeting. Next, we have Sylvia for our tech and gesture eva evaluation. Yes, uh, the evaluation on uh, gestures was hit um, by both Jen and Tom regarding the hands. Very, we are laxed with that. I did write that down. Uh, Larry McKenzie, I liked your blizzard sign, your blizzard scenery behind you. It brought back a lot of good memories of blizzard of 77. I was only in junior high. I got out of a science test three times. It was great. Good things, good things happen. And, um, and I was looking at 
Tom H. walking around with his mask. I know he's working, but I thought it was kind of funny. It just distracted me a little bit, but I understand he was working. Like I said, not too many hands during the club with our group this morning. Margo loved your eyes when you were doing table topics, when you were thinking of what was going on. You didn't have, you were in Ithaca. I think you said Ithaca? Yes. Um, and But Albany, you did have a storm in 69. Uh, Tracy had her glasses on top of her head. She would put them down when she was reading her uh, screen a little bit or agenda. Steve, I love it. You're doing it right now. You're thinking. You you do that quite a bit, and it was it's great because you see you're really focused into what you're going to uh, what you're looking at the screen. Dave Lakata, the voice uh, at the very beginning of your speech was fading in and out, and I lost a little bit of what you were saying, but it was like two times real quick, and then it strained right out. Phil, you used your fingers, one, two, I like that. Eric was using his pen when he was giving his evaluation. Mokos, I like how you share your screen. You did it so nice and smoothly. I haven't attempted that yet. It's, it's nice. I'm trying to think if I've seen anything else. I think that's it. That's my evaluation. Thank you, Sylvia. That was great. Now, our trivia portion of the meeting, as it were, David Jones is our quiz, quiz master. Quiz us. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. My first question is Tom Moram was the invocator. Invocation? Yes. Who did he do this quote by? Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, yes. Very Martin good. Try to keep this answer clean. It does have a specific answer. But what does Sylvia need by March 16th? Who's? <laughs> Who's? There you go. Uh, let me see. Uh, Carol was a quote master. Who was her quote by? Hmm. I believe it was Chief Crowfoot. Chief Crowfoot. That sounded kind of cool. And where was Margot during the blizzard of 77? She was just a little kid back in Albany. Cornell. <laughs> well, Cornell, Cornell to be Cornell. specific. And yeah. what was she wearing, according to her? Her little mini skirt. <laughs> mini skirt and boots, exactly. Certain, yes, I was. certain things stick in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and Mokolos's hey, friend. Hey, what I did in college. <laughs> Mokolis' um, friend Adosto, Adosto, what was his second favorite quote? And I think it was important for Toastmasters. Does anyone remember? No? Mokolis, do you want to answer it? Don't, don't raise your voice. Improve your argument. Improve your uh -huh. argument, yeah. And last one, what award does Eric think Stefan should win? Tony. 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 There you Tony. go. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, everybody. Let's all clap. Let's all clap. Practice clapping and waving. <laughs> waving, waving. The all more right. you do it, more energy is in the group. Just FYI. <laughs> thank you, Mokos, for raising the energy level. And thank you, David, for that great quiz. Are there any announcements? Uh, Larry, we have our word of the day. Yes, thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, for saving me to the very end. I thought that with using our reports, we might get a couple of extra uses of the word of the day. The beginning of the meeting, the, the word took off. There was a blizzard of people saying the word blizzard. When the second half started, there was a Puxatani Phil sighting because he said, will there be any more words of the day or will there not be? Well, guess what? There was only one verbally, which was Nancy Ferry. Nancy, thank you for that. But I must say, some people must have been worried about the blizzard because in the chat, there were a lot of people discussing the blizzard. Maybe not the same one that we're referring to behind us. And those were Len, Eric, Mark, and a couple of other people. 
the word of the day was blizzard. Hopefully we don't see another one for a long time. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster. Thank Let's you. Wait. Let's wait. Okay. And with that, I turn it, I'll turn it over to Eric, our club president, to do the awards and announcements. Thank you, Samir. What a great meeting today. Well, definitely hope we don't have another blizzard soon. I put in the chat about the, the blizzard 2014, but Joe is right that it'll take a miracle to top off 1977. So I will go into our awards today and we're really and on time today. Our best table topics winner is Beth Banks. Congratulations, Beth. Our best evaluator today is Phil Russell. Yep. Congratulations, Phil. And our best speaker of the day is Steve Smith. Congratulations, Steve. Are there any announcements, final announcements from the floor this morning? Yes, Larry. Just a reminder that there is the, this Saturday at 9 a.m., the speech contest will be held. And there is a 6.30 meeting tonight, which is to go over the, the feedback. Uh, to, so that there is no feedback, but it is a contestant, um, contestant briefing tonight at 6.30. So if Len is available, he could perhaps start our social hour this evening. That would be great. It'll be tough. I'll try. I, I have bowling tonight. Okay. I can do it. Back, back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Oh, president. Or, or Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Kay said she said she would be on to um, start the social hour tonight. I can do it. Yeah. Sorry. On the feedback loop. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Sure. And we like to wish our contestants, myself, Larry, and Phil, who are going to be competing in the Area 11 contest this weekend. So we look forward to seeing you all come and cheer on at our contestants for the event. And David, sure. I see you have an announcement. Um, well, I have two things. Number one, we did not do a toast of the day. So I would like to do a toast to oh. myself for giving the toast. That's something I always look forward to when I come <laughs> here. So toast to AM Lockport. And my second is I am the um, audit chairman of district, district 37 here in Charlotte, and we had somebody drop out. So if anybody's interested in helping out, I can use somebody from a different district to look at our financials. It's all online and there's not much to it because there hasn't been much activity. So if anybody wants to be an audit committee person, you can reach out to me. I'd appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Our Toastmaster for next week is Len Thornton. Len will have a theme hopefully in the next week. So but we look probably. forward. What's that? Most probably. Okay, perfect. Well, if there's no any other announcements, um, social hours tonight, 7 p.m. We look forward to seeing you there. And stick around for post toasties. I hope everyone has a wonderful Thursday and a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody.